All right. Six. Hi, everybody. DJ here online. Uh, just letting you all know, we're waiting about five minutes for the last of our folks to arrive here and everybody to get in from the waiting room. But welcome. Uh, great selection tonight, has ever. So looking forward to and enjoying some good company, virtually and in person, and some good whiskey. Cheers. Five minutes. <laughs> just got asked what's our patrick's day plans i'm like i think mine might be go to hawaii you know spend the week spend the long week in hawaii on, on fall or on spring break you know maybe get to enjoy it this year um just want to say welcome to everybody i think we're going to give it another minute or two to 705 a couple of latecomers and uh, we'll get started once again i said uh, I, I say this every time but um we have a nice selection tonight. Uh, it is the first whiskey I think I've done this whole year, and we have 50 whiskeys deep that I've actually repeated. I have done Bushmills 21 in December of 2017, and I recognize one person in the room was present when I did it. Yes. Um, so I'm excited that we've gotten through so many whiskeys and haven't had a repeated whiskey. Uh, it's going to happen at some point, right? You can only do so many. Uh, but um, it's been a while. I mean, we did what? Bushmills 21, there was 20 of us in the back room, right? 15, having a quiet little party in the back, back in the olden days, can't do that no more. So, uh, but you know, tonight's, um, and, and the other thing is, if you had been here for the Glenlivet dinner that took place on May 30th, 2019 with Rick Edwards, had you been here? Um, we did five whiskeys and we did five course dinner with Glenlivet. Um, and Rick Edwards was an absolute blast. And um, we actually did Apple Hour 12. I thought we did the Abuna. I went back and looked at the menu this past week and we actually did Apple Hour 12. So technically we've done the 12 before, but it wasn't with me. I was doing my Buddha moment in the corner watching this guy, Rick Edwards. I've never seen anybody with the energy this guy had. When I introduced him, I introduced him, I handed him a wireless microphone. He says, you can put the microphone down, I don't use them. I said, okay, sure. And I sat down and enjoyed our five course meal. When the world gets back to normal, we're planning one with Balvini. 
David Laird will come and we'll do a dinner with Balvini here, probably the whole patio. And uh, very excited about that. We had him on for our December tasting. So I think it's 7.04, we've got one minute and we'll get started with our presentation. For everyone here, we do a presentation you can watch. We assume we have some new people. I know tonight we have some new people from Snohomish, Washington joining us, welcome. And we also have some people that have bought tickets tonight, but then last minute realized they had a conflict. And so we put it on our YouTube channel and they're gonna watch it for the second time, record it in their back garden in a party environment. So remember, you can do that too. You can just, you know, use TiVo and pretend it's live, right? So McLean's enjoy your tasting. That's the McLean group that uh, bought tickets and have already picked up. So we're gonna get started. Uh, my name is DJ, owner of Celtic, and uh, been doing this for a little while and really enjoy it. And my soccer team won today after losing Sunday. So I'm on a bit of a high tonight. We hadn't scored a goal in nearly 500 minutes and we scored three today against Tottenham Hotspur. So I was elated. It was gonna make or break my day. Um, and the twins slept pretty good as well. Sorry about that, yeah. Um, so we'll get started with a presentation. Anybody online? Would love you to give us, use the chat room. Please ask questions. Might take a whiskey or two for you to get started. Um, no question's a bad question. And love to hear what you think of the whiskeys at the end. Give us your order. And um, I will say since March, oh my God, we've done what, 15, 20 tastings, either public or private. I haven't had a single whiskey not get a first place vote. So no pressure guys, but that means we picked them well. And we've had $30 whiskeys sit alongside $250 whiskeys. And somebody says, yeah, I like the 250. My favorite was this one. And that makes me feel really good. I won't talk about the price unless you ask me or at the end. So we'll get started. All right, so yeah, what are we doing at Celtic? Well, we're surviving. Uh, limited hours, not open Monday, close early to Shelby County, that rules. Um, we're doing Super Bowl and we've got a couple of specials. We're doing Valentine's Day, um, Val Valentine's Day, probably reservation, maybe reservation only. We're going to do crawfish. We have a crawfish pr provider from Mississippi. We're going to get it in and we're going to really try to make sure you can get it to go. We are doing um, Uber and DoorDash. And I don't mind saying this because I really feel for restaurants that do it and don't adjust. We did Uber and DoorDash, took our prices added 20% to them. Uber and DoorDash actually charged 30. So you're taking a 10% hit with what I'm doing. So in order to keep myself straight, we turn around and anybody that orders directly from our website gets 10% off. So we're on the level footing with all of our, our to-go products. So um, really encourage other restaurants to do that or suffer the consequences of being on Uber at a price point where you really can't make any money I know of one particular restaurant where he was pleading for people not order directly with me instead of using these tools. And I'm like, well, you, you offer the tools. So it's a little unfair for people They get comfortable, click a button and it's at their door, set the price right. Because people who order like that are very comfortable with them um, a sort of somewhat conveniency price, right? So, um, so this, uh, so it's important. So, Live tastings, the ones in person we did featured these whiskeys. Some absolutely amazing whiskeys here. I think Jeff, you were here for the Middleton Rare, uh, the Red Breast Small Batch, the Green Spot Chateau Montalena. I brought the Green Spot actually, um, Chateau Louisville Barton with me tonight. And uh, for those um, I might get hopefully share with, a couple of very nice scotch there, Glen Dronish 21 and Glen Farkless 17. Its older brother will be featured the next tasting. We went to France as well, and we're delighted to have had the owner of the distillery join us for a cameo on that tasting. It was fantastic. I try to roll out my very best French, and it might be something I might still do is brush up on my French. Um, and we had Japan. So in person, these are all the whiskeys we did. So today I did something. I went back and checked. See you, Jeff. Thank you. Good night, thank you. I went back and checked, when is the last time we did a whiskey that was on our menu? And you have to go back to the tasting that featured 
whiskey, uh, basically go back to seven tastings ago. So in the last six tastings, we have not done a whiskey that's officially on our menu. Last seven tastings, or last six tastings, 18 whiskeys. None of them are on our menu. The last one was DWD Dublin, Liberator, uh, Killarney, Ireland, and Balvini, 21-year-old Portwood. And bef- I mean, they're just fantastic. Um, before that, we did an unbelievable Mars Koma Gagataki uh, from, from Japan that was probably one of my favorites. And I will say this, guys, Koma Gagataki was not everybody's. In fact, I think I might have had four or five people that night. But just to go to show you that everyone has a different palate. So I was kind of a lone ranger on that one. Like when we did Method of Madness from, from Middleton Cork. I was about the only person in the room that liked that would said it was my favorite. So there is no, everyone's palate's different. Okay. Very much so. So. Whiskey, the world, March 11th. We did it in collaboration with uh, the daily Memphian. Fantastic event. Very difficult to do it that night. That's the night, the, the day that the NBA player tested positive and the world started the shutters were coming down. So it was a tough one to do. Um, obviously back then we weren't wearing masks, it's weird. We had a fairly nice group in the back tent. Uh, we featured all of these whiskeys. I won't get into them, they were just, you didn't have base light whiskeys making the cut. I had um, certain representatives saying, hey, we've got to do this, 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 this. I was like, yeah, they're not, we want to keep it sort of exclusive, not necessarily in a price point exclusive, but maybe in the terms of not being, you know, not being well whiskey. So I don't want to mention any names. Here is a, our next tasting. I thought I'd do it on the front end because everyone's gone at the end. On your left is the first whiskey from County Mayo, Ireland, my home county. It's a, a rum cast finish. I really like it. The bottle's up here if you want to take a look. Slightly hand grenade bottle as well. In the middle, on the right, is a, a um, whiskeys I tasted last Friday with Benish, one of our reps, and I was really, really impressed. And I was telling Jeff, the whiskey advocate, which I, I, I have down here, uh, has one of the whiskeys as the top 20 of the 2020 uh, releases. Um, so I'm excited to say, see you guys, thank you, that uh, we picked the hedon- hedonism not uh, hedonism on the right compass box blend john glazer is the blender uh, he's in his early 40s i believe hopefully we'll get to maybe if not connect via email um love to have him on but it's you know two o'clock in the morning in scotland and in the middle then we mentioned glenn farkless 17 the last time and uh we're doing the 21 which is superlative why 21 well tonight we're doing a 21 december we did a 21 in February, we'll do a 21. In March, we'll do a 21. They're 21-year-old age whiskeys. We're saying good riddance and goodbye to 2020 by doing a 21-year-old whiskey. So that's a little thing we came up with. Um, hopefully, um, hopefully, we'll see our way out of this when we we'll keep doing 21s till every, we, we put our hands up in the room. Who's been vaccinated? And all hands go up and we're, we're getting back to somewhat normalcy. If you buy a ticket tonight and talk to one of our guys, we're going to do the tickets for 10% off, okay? If you wish. So what are we into? We're into nosing our whiskey. We're into tasting our whiskey. I love to chew the whiskey. Uh, taste it any way you want. Taste it with water. On your table on your- here, you've got pipettes. Um, at home, if you want to add some water, we usually recommend the water when we get into higher APV whiskeys. Tonight, we, we, we have... Two 4080s, that's the 80 proof, first and last. And in the middle, we have Blanton's at 93 proof or 46.5, if my math is right. Half a 93, anybody? That's fine. No, 46, but yeah. So uh, that's what we want to get. We want to get done and get you to enjoy it, taste it. A little cheat sheet for those who are newcomers, a couple of guys here, Chase and Joey. Um, I'm sure you probably already know this. Little discerning differences between the different whiskeys from different parts of the world and different parts of the states. So from the bottom, Tennessee whiskey uh, has a lot of the rules uh, that are similar to bourbon, um, with the exception being 
and it must be, there you go, use a unique maple charcoal filtering process during distillation with differentiates from bourbon. Interesting. Except one. Yes, I like it. Richards Tennessee whiskey and we have the owner present. Very, very good. Well, yeah, well, we have lineage. Lineage. Yes, yes. Fantastic. So without further ado, if you have your bottle at home or here, go ahead and pour it. Green bottle. Um, delicious whiskey. I've had most fun with this of the three because the other two, um, I had a lot of fun with Blanton's as well. Bushmills I've done before and um, have drank quite a bit of Bushmills 21 because it was the whiskey from my daughter's birth. So I would love a glass. Grab a glass. Ah, uh, Johnny. Thanks, Johnny. Huh? No problem. Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Can't even get a night off. It's date night. Oh. She's going to have to step up here and introduce herself. You know that, John, right? That's part of the deal. Right? Just want to say hello to uh, Uncle Philip and Snohomish as well. And my father-in-law, who's been very generous with his time around helping us with uh, pub issues so we don't have to call our electrician and spend a fortune. We're trying to keep our bills down. Uh, our business is running at about slightly under 50% normal production, if that makes sense. Um, no, right around 50%. And somehow we figured a way to make it work at 50%. And um, it's nothing that's made me proud. My guys have been fantastic. My staff have been very understanding going into separate groups. What separate groups mean is group A does not work with group B. Group A does not see group B. Group A does not socialize with group B. So they keep them completely separate. It keeps our restaurant clean. It's something I have a friend of mine who's a nurse said that we're doing at the hospital. I'm like, we got to do that or else every time you have a, a, a positive case, you're closing. We had two tests positive. One was a false positive. One was a positive that we ended up shutting for a couple of days to going through the proper procedures has for Shelby County. And I was like, well, if this happens every time, I'm, I'm going to have twins that are never going to see me. So that's where we came up with the pod system. Try to stay open, try to work through it. And honestly, it's tough on them. It's really difficult. And you know, some, hopefully when we get out of this, we'll get to celebrate and, and hang out together. But it's difficult because you're, you're a slim line merged group of people trying to do a lot more tasks. And you're pretty much, if you're working the weekend, you're working a very long shift. You could be here 12 hours. Or more, or more. So we're off to Scotland. I love it. I was telling someone on Sunday, I love Ireland. It's my home. I think I prefer Scotland. I love going there. I feel like maybe I'm on vacation. Um, I feel like whiskey is more in their blood than ours. Uh, the cab driver in Ireland will probably tell you how bad the government is. The cab driver in Scotland is probably, at his other job, a whiskey taster. That's what I found. They're really into their whiskeys in a very, very, very deep manner. And it's about 25 to 30% of the economy in Scotland. Every dollar created, 25, 30% goes back to whiskey. Okay, so it has a much bigger uh, impression and footprint in Scotland than it has in Ireland. On the, up here, we're looking at the four regions. For the newcomers, Scotland is about the size of Ireland. Ireland and Scotland are about the size of South Carolina. That's the closest state they have. South Carolina is slightly smaller. Ireland is slightly bigger. Scotland is very close at about 31,000 square kilometers, okay? Whiskey in Scotland is divided into these regions, uh, a total of six. We have in the bottom left, the Islay region on the west coast of the islands, usually peaty, okay? which we don't do very often because it doesn't cross enough pallets. But we will do the odd one that has a little bit of peat, but not very often. Then we have Campbelltown, the home of whiskey in the world in the 1890s. The two biggest uh, regions for whiskey in the world were Ireland and Campbelltown, Mulligan Tire. If you know the song, that's where you're at, okay? 
Then we have the low lime whiskies all the way to the border with England. And they have a certain distinct character of being lighter and generally summer whiskies. Then if I go top left, we have island whiskies, which I love. They're sort of middle of the road, maybe a touch of peace. Uh, example, maybe Oban, Oban 14. And then if you look at the island all the way around the corner, they're the Orkney Islands, which we've done a couple of their whiskies. We did the Highland Park 25 and we did the Highland Park cast strength in October, okay? And then that big, big sort of neon green area, that is the Highlands of Scotland. Mountainous, beautiful. Um, it was, nobody could ever conquer the Highlands. Just like conquering Ireland was tough, conquering the Highlands throughout history has been next to impossible. They are very, very tough people that live there. If uh, you probably need a nuclear bomb to, to take over the Highlands. Inside the Highlands then is an area called Speyside. It's actually geographically in the Highlands. The Highlands represent about one third of the entire land area. Although that map makes it look more, actually I think it's two thirds. Two thirds of all of Scotland is Highlands, okay? And Speyside is a region geographically within the Highlands, and it's actually the concentration of the most distilleries in the world. Right now, standing at about 57 distilleries are regioned in that purple area, okay? And our first whiskey tonight is Abelour. It's uh, from the town of um, Abelour or Campbelltown of Abelour. And it's... Um, it's uh, it's uh, a beautiful little town. I've, I don't think I've actually gone through it, but it looks beautiful. I feel like I've been there in the last week, if you would. Population, 972. Um, beautiful little town. Probably bloats a lot in the summertime with tourism. Uh, dates back to about the 14th century. And um, the on your left is the bridge. It's an interesting bridge. Uh, we have one in Ireland. The one in Ireland is a footbridge just like this across the Liffey. I'm sure some of you have been there, may have crossed, and it's called the Penny Bridge. They're, sorry, in Ireland it's called the Half Penny Bridge. You pay a half penny back in the day to cross the bridge. Victoria Bridge was founded by the Abelour founder, James Fleming, and it, uh, it actually was opened in 1902, but James Fleming died in, um, he died in 1895. So, uh, 1896 actually, and, uh, Lived, um, lived basically 65 years, was born in 1830, was born and baptized on his birthday. So I found that interesting. He was truly Catholic. They wanted to make it clear this fellow was Catholic. Uh, on, that's him on your right there. A very, very philanthropist type of man back in the day. Three things he's noted for. He obviously built the bridge after several drownings between two villages, Nakhnadu and... Um, Abelour, young kids were trying to cross the river and there was a couple of drownings in the early 1890s. And a couple, two months before his death actually, he commissioned money for the building of the bridge. In the late 1880s, he commissioned bequested money for the building of a hospital called the Abelour Cottage Hospital. And I found this very ironic. What, did the, what was the hospital's function? The hospital's function was for the isolation of people during a pandemic. How interesting is that, huh? Okay. And uh, the third thing he did was he created a meeting hall, a community meeting hall. Uh, it's now called the Fleming Meeting Hall, still there to this day. Abelard Distillery itself was actually on the bottle, it says 1879. Pretty little bottle. Um, I found this to be really interesting because I'll just, and we'll get into it in, in detail, but just First of all, the whiskey's fabulous. Um, watched a lot of stuff on, on the Master Distiller right now. And uh, the history is great. And it's a very small time player in, in the field of scotch. On the bottle, we've got a 1879 is actually the established date. The actual distillery, first Abelard Distillery was built in 1826. And it was built by James and John's Grant. Now, for those of you who've been here a few times, You've heard me talking about the grants, right? Many, many times. And a Ulysses grant, I think our 10th president, 
uh, is in the lineage of that same Grant Scotch whiskey family and how they uh, sided with the Catholics against the Protestants and in the basically the fight for the monarchy back to the James the first, James the second days that we always somehow end up coming back to F again and again. And when we get to Bushmills, lo and behold, who gave Bushmills a license? James the first. So we just can't seem to get away from that period. So on your right, James Fleming, on your left is a picture of the distillery. Interesting on the barrels, if you look, it says Abelauer Glenlivet. I don't know if anyone was here for some of the Glenlivet tastings, how their name was grabbed by all the distilleries in the valley. Everybody wanted to be associated with Glenlivet because they were the premier whiskey. Well, Glenlivet took everybody to court and said, listen, we don't like our name being used. Our distillery is called Glenlivet. Can you do something about this? Well, they didn't win the case, but they didn't lose it. They said, everybody can use Glenlivet as, a, as an area of where the distillery is from. But Glenlivet themselves, they are called the Glenlivet, okay? So very interesting. They got to separate themselves from everybody else. But everybody at the time wanted to consider themselves as somehow connected to Glenlivet because they at the time were not just the premier whiskey, they're the ones also that had got their footprint furthest around the world and down into London and into the monarchy. And so Avalar, the whiskey itself, interesting. I mean, uh, if you were to pick out top selling single malts in the world, it doesn't feature in the top 10, not even close, okay? Has a production facility it produces in normal times about 4 million liters a year. And um, the bigger players, let's talk about them, Balvenie, Glenlivet, um, McKellen, um, Glenfiddich, obviously, number one selling single malt in the world, but not in the USA, it's Glenlivet. The other way around, John? Uh, Glenfiddich is, no, actually, Glenfiddich's number one in the world, Glenlivet's number one in the US, okay? But in France, now I say France and you go, oh God, the French. Yes, the France. The French number one selling single malt is Avalar. I found that astonishing. And you know, we, you love them or hate them. They're, if you were gonna become a chef, where do you need to study? You need to study in France. So they know their food and cuisine. They probably have good palates and they're, they are the number one consuming country per capita of scotch in the world. So I have asked this question in previous tastings and I have sat here with people yelling out countries till eventually I was like, okay, let's cancel that question. I'll ask something else and give out my spot prize. No one ever got it. Number one is France. Number two, John knows here, except it's interesting. Number two, once again, I'd probably be here till midnight. I don't want to keep you. I want to keep this to an hour, an hour and a half, but uh, it's Uruguay. How crazy is that, huh? Number two, yeah. US is fourth, Ireland's eighth. And uh, these are the, and you can look all this up, the ranking of top Scotch drinkers per capita. Okay, brandy in the late 1700s suffered a epidemic of where they suffered a basically almost like a virus. Brandy was dumped, destroyed, and the French, instead of their brandy, latched onto scotch. Became the market for scotch. So I'd like to think they know what they're talking about. Number one in Scotland is Avalar. Uh, number two is um, Ben Riach. Number three is Glenfiddich. And number four is Glenn Grant. Interesting that we've done all of these, right? And I say that generically, like it doesn't mean the 12 year old, but actually the 12 year old for tonight is their flagship, is their best seller. They have a 16 year old, 18 year old. They have an Abuna, which is Gaelic for origin. And um, it's not that long on the market and it's cast strength. And then they have a batch release called the Anim. Um, suffice it to say, I had thought we did the Abuna during our Glenlivet dinner in 2019, but no, we actually done the Abelauer 12. So it is their flagship. Um, the liquid, you can continue, the liquid that's in the 12, the 16, and the 18, 
is the same. The aging is different. Exactly the same distillate. What come off the pot stills is in all three whiskeys. It's just the aging process is different. The Abelauer is aged in Sherry Olorosa and what they call traditional oak casts. And I was like, traditional oak casts? Can it be a bit more descriptive? And I was researching it and it's another fancy way of saying we got our barrels that were previously used to age bourbon from Kentucky and they were sent, dismantled, sent to Scotland. We bought them for pennies on the dollar for what they were cost to make them. And we, um, I think these guys get them from Jim Beam but they, they reassemble them. So they're basically bourbon seasoned American oak casts, but they call them traditional oak casts. So traditional oak, Olorosa Sherry, we don't have the breakdown. They will not tell you, we asked, and that's usually say, well, 60% of the whiskey that's married into the single malt is aged in sherry, 40% is aged in uh, formerly bourbon, and that's where we, approximately obviously subject to tasting but we didn't get that we didn't get a breakdown of of what makes up the whiskey and to be honest that's fairly normal not knowing that and that's starting to change we're seeing a change in scotland we're seeing changing in ireland now where they're becoming a bit more transparent in what's in the whiskey where they're getting the barley from what where they're getting the cast from how and how long it's aged and what proportion of whiskeys or um, what proportion of whiskeys come from each barrel. You'll see that next month when we do Compass Box, totally transparent. They might be aging the whiskey in four different barrels, re-aging a married portion of those uh, barrels separately and aging and coming up with a final product. But they're telling you exactly what's in the whiskey. For those of you who are here for Waterford, that's a great example. They, they talk about a passport for every bottle. So every single bottle of whiskey has a trans, a number. It's, a, it's a, a number that relays back to every single detail. What part of the field? What was the soil makeup? What was the, where was the bar barley kept? What stall? What was the driver's name? What was the registration plate of the, I'm serious. This is where we're heading, I think. So anyway, let's get on to tasting our first, which is, I don't have a lot left guys. That's it from a couple of, uh, I think two or three bottles. Um, as you can see, but it's quite a nice orange glow to it. And once again, guys, those at home, please share your thoughts. Um, this tasting was primarily done with my sister-in-law, Elizabeth, whose palate I wish I had. She's got a great palate. And um, we had a bit of fun. Um, with this whiskey so um please share share don't be shy and um, the first thing i thought about this whiskey is it's very sippable very drinkable very drunkable <laughs> i think if you got started into this there could be some serious damage um it's super smooth um I'm hoping people get the cherries like I did. It's one of the first things I got. Certain things I pick up a lot easier than others. I got the apple and the cherries. Almost getting salted caramel on the nose. And then on the palate, then I talked about creme brulee. A lot of people, a lot of the tasters talk about Christmas cake in this. Christmas cake. Delicious Christmas cake. I always try to disregard my first sip. Remember, I'm drinking Guinness. Usually I'm doing these. Uh, probably too many. Um, I told my staff restrict me tonight, just in case I am up in the middle of the night. Um, but uh, I did have, John used to pour me contiguously. So at the end of the tasting with John, I was like, how many pints of Guinness do I have? I'm like, he goes, I don't know. I just kept pouring. That's what you told me to do. I'm like, no, I didn't. No, I didn't, John. Huh? No, I didn't. Uh, I disregard my first taste, guys. And then I like, me personally, I like to chew it. Why? Those taste buds are all over your tongue, but particularly in the back corners of your tongue.
Yeah. You know, I didn't get butterscotch the first night I tasted this, but I got it the second night, and I got, I'm getting it tonight. Butterscotch should be. But then what, what makes up butterscotch, right? What's in butterscotch? Vanilla, right? What else? So, burnt sugar and vanilla is almost your ingredients. So it's got a quite sugary. I said black pepper and someone concurred here online, but a lot of the tasters talked about cinnamon in this. I just couldn't, I did, did not. We had cardamom come up in um, Edward Hour. Edward Hour. And I think it also came up in Glenlivet, the uh, cognac finish. Yeah. Yep. So um, I said fortune cookie. Why? I was like, it we had some. I was able to open a fortune cookie cracker, smell it and taste it. And that's what is on the finish for me. So um, a very, a little gem in the pack, kind of like we've been doing all year with our clonic hilties and our dingles and our method of madness and our drum shambo and our, and our um, Grace O'Malley, the, one, the famous Irish pirate that we'll cover next month. So we've been really like staying off the beaten path of whiskey tasting. Uh, Balcone is another great one. Uh, Sagamore Rye, um, Koval, Chicago. I mean, we have not stayed mainstream in anything we've done, and it's it's been a, it's been a blast. And Whiskey Advocate, by the way, at number eight, I think, was a Balcones product. Really, right? Also a Glenmorangie, uh, Aperfeldy. Um, I mean, we had we didn't necessarily have the whiskey in there, but we had a whiskey from probably eight to ten distilleries in the top twenty of whiskey Whiskey Advocate for twenty for twenty twenty one. So very interesting, yeah. Uh, Drum Shambo is in there, which I have at home, which now we'll do, but it's the, it just arrived in town, I believe. It's the sister whiskey of gunpowder. Yeah, which is County Leitrim. It's the next county over from County Mayo. So we'll definitely be covering that. I believe it showed up at Buster's very recently, right? Jeff's getting into his house tomorrow and we'll be here at nine o'clock tomorrow night. Okay. I know. You're talking about the drum shambo. What, what, what price? What, what price? Said, what price? Yeah, not bad. Right? Not crazy. Yeah. It's, it's tasty. I had it over here uh, about two months ago just to share it around. I think, John, you got to try it. The drum shambo pot still. Yeah. Anyway, back. I digress a bit. So, yeah, that's what we have. I mean, white chocolate, some butterscotch, salted caramel. Anybody else here in the room would like to? Richard Mercha, what do you think? Scotch. Fantastic, really, excellent. So I know we have them inside. If you'd like to try when you can, the two most famous things from Abelauer are Walker's shortbread. I have some, everybody at home should have got a bag. Please enjoy. And the next most famous thing from Abelauer, town 972 people, is their whiskey. So that's their big thing is the Walker shortbread. And, and I just like Walker shortbread. I think I've seen those in fresh markets. So I went and got as much as I could get at two fresh markets. And I dumped them all in the bags. And there's some here for you guys. We'll have them maybe towards the end. But they are delicious. Say what you want. Don't look at the calorie count on them. Just <laughs> eat them. They're delicious. Um, my wife had obviously looked at it before because when I came home with them, she goes, please put those away. Do not let me see them, please. So delicious starter whiskey. Um, I don't know what the price is. I'm going to say 50, 60, somewhere in that region. So not crazy expensive, um, but super sippable, super drunkable, and uh, pr pretty nice. Ladies, what do you think? You're not getting it, no? There you go. Wonderful. Yes. 
Yeah, the first time I didn't get it for some reason, I, I, I still truly believe the best time to taste, guys, 5 a.m. 5 a.m. or 5, I don't know what it is. I cannot put my finger in it. But a 5 a.m. or 5.30 tasting is just incredible. There's no noise. Yeah. That's what I like to do. I mean, I was up. It's funny. On Monday this week, Eric's like, somebody was in Dropbox at 5.22 this morning. I'm like, that was me. Because I'd be doing the edits, and it's sent, our Dropbox is sent to notify you. Your Dropbox was edited. I'm like, that was me. And that's when I like to do it. I was like, dash downstairs, glasses on, tasting, dog one side, dog the other, peace, calm, no phones, no noise, no TVs, little sip of water, and then taste my whiskey. And that's when it's... It, it, it definitely helps to wake your body, if you know what I mean. But, but... I, I feel a very sense of clarity as well, mentally. Like, I just feel like, you know, the lights came on, right? I feel that. Without feeling any sort of, I mean, we're only doing tiny tastes, right? We're not here to get drunk. Good whiskey tasting is not about getting drunk. It's truly about everything else but that, right? Um, but it's one that I find I get the notes that I couldn't taste earlier if I tried in the morning. And I, and I think, to be honest, if you really want to get there, taste the whiskey and then taste it at 5.30 a.m. But well before coffee. I mean, coffee, now they're saying coffee's very good for you guys. All right, whiskey number two, and then we take a little five-minute break after this. This is going to be your yellow spot. And for, is everybody, ha we're going to be getting those, they're all out, everyone has them? Wow, we're, we're getting awful of fish in the Celtic Crossing, Jesus. We should take over the vaccines uh, circulation. Huh? Everyone has a yellow spot in the room? Man, we can run the vaccine pool now, me and you. Hmm. This is a lovely little story. Um, let me just mention, uh, their brand director now is a fellow by the name of Andrew Weir, and he's better known as Young Hamish and Braveheart. He is the brand director in the U.S. And um, if we can ever get him to come to town, we will. Um, he's a big Perna Ricard. It's now owned by Perna Ricard, okay? Was owned by Campbell and Company. Perna Ricard bought it in 1974. And um, probably turned the distillery around from <laughs> potentially disappearing to a profitable 4 million liter entity now and probably use some of their malts in some of the Glenlivet other products, okay? What else should I tell you? Um, oh yeah, uh, James Fleming, uh, famous saying, let the deeds show. Let the deeds show meant actions speak louder than words. Judge by my whiskey, by the whiskey, and forget about everything else, okay? Biggest markets in the States, Cali and Chicago. Um, how do they stand out in the crowd? Well, they have good value, um, experimentation, they like to try new things, and um, through sheer popularity and renown in certain locations, this being France. And um, they really treasure their French customers. They really do. So that's pretty much it. Um, Current master is still, I thought I turned those off. Maybe someone else turned them back on. I thought I turned the fans off. Um, is Graham Cruzshank? He's 55. He's from a nearby town called, town called Keith, which is a big whiskey town. And he started the distillery at 19. He's 55 now. Uh, and he is, uh, he's been there forever. But I found this really interesting is I watched a, a, a piece on him. And he, in the last five years, went back to school. And I'm guessing, I was just intrigued. Like, if he went back to school, what do you think he studied? Well, I'll tell you what he studied. Electronic engineering. Because the whiskey world has become so electronic in everything they do. He decided to do a degree. A degree and I thought that was amazing. So now he's the master distiller, 55 years old, spent 35 years of his life at the distillery, Pretty much entire career is Abelauer, 
and uh, you know, loves it. Sounds amazing. Comes to a lot of the whiskey events in Chicago, uh, California, and New York. The International Spirits Convention in New York. He will be there. If you went to the Avalar tent, or um, you'll probably get to meet him. So now onwards and upwards. Let's go to the largest and biggest in America, Sazerac. Okay, Buffalo Trace Distillery. Um, it is in Frankfurt, Kentucky, not Frankfurt, Germany, Frankfurt, Kentucky. Um, it's, it's been under a couple of different names. Um, was originally called Old Fashioned Copper. For a very long time, it was called the George T. Stagg Distillery. It's the oldest continuously operating distillery in America. It's massive at 400 acres and it produces, remember we talked about four and 10 a while ago? It's one of the big boys, 10 million liters a year. Massive portfolio all the way across the bottom there. And we've done a few of them, right? I see Taylor uh, left of center. Um, we have on our, behind our, quite a few of these behind our bar. Our well bourbon is benchmark. Um, obviously their biggest and number one seller is uh, Buffalo Trace. Buffalo Trace is named after the buffaloes crossing the river, the Kentucky River in Franklin County. Um, the distillery is also the owner of Blanton's Bourbon. And uh, Blanton's is in honor of the guy on the left, which is Albert B. Blanton, uh, who's basically his claim to fame is I kept, um, I kept a distillery of OFC open during prohibition. He kept it alive and running during pro prohibition. He spent 55 years at the OFC distillery and um, he died in 1959. Um, the guy on the right is the other pioneer of the urban world. It's Elmer T. Lee. Um, uh, fascinating characters. The more you read about them, uh, it, they're amazing. Um, he spent 35 years at Buffalo Trace, and he died in 2013, but I found it interesting. He was born in 1919, and his date of his birth is 8519. And the date of my birth is... 8569. So we were separated by a nice, cool, even 50 years to the day. I found that. Just, so I am now uh, connected to uh, Elmer T. So I like to try and get some of his centenary whiskeys. Um, Bennett hasn't come up Trump's yet, but I'm sure he will at some point with um, the Elmer T. T. Lee centenary edition. Is that right, Bennett? Uh, okay. um, so what we're dealing with here is basically. Um, Blanton's bourbon, premium by, by, for a reason. It's premium because it is hard to get, difficult to acquire. As someone told me today, oh, if you lived in, you know, middle Tennessee, you could go from several counties to all the liquor stores in your area to find Blanton's. Or you needed to be on a list in a place like Memphis to get access to this. So it's a hard to get, not terribly expensive. Although when I look online now, it's tripled in price from what effectively is its true market price. Why? Supply and demand. We've talked about that a lot, okay? I've seen it for near up, upwards of $200 bottle online, okay? Um, it came out in 1984, and it's the first true single cast whiskey ever. That's his claim to fame, okay? And it's Elmer T. Lee oversaw the um, production of this. It was in Warehouse H at Buffalo Trace. So Warehouse H considered to be the most premium area in the entire uh, size of aging whiskeys for them. It had the premium whiskey. So all Blanton's is selected from Warehouse H. And Warehouse H was actually built by Blanton around prohibition time. So um, very interesting. Go ahead and pour yourself some. I'm gonna do that too. Um, that's the cork. Cork is a horse 
in different positions. And um, it's kind of cultish, guys. It's a little cultish. John and I talked a little bit about this, but you're trying to get all the letters, right? And it's the letters, is the horse in different positions, all right? Oh, there it is. There it is. So B, what have we got here? This is T. This is T. So I'm going to be ONS. So I'm going to be right next to front and center there, to the right. That's me here. That's my one here. Okay. And it also has an important information like the, uh, the Rick number it was taken from, the barrel number it came out of. And single barrel means nothing else gets added, guys. It is couple of hundred bottles out of a barrel of bourbon. That is it. There is nothing else at it. If anybody needs a glass, please raise your hand and we'll make sure you get, please do not reuse your glass. It'll, it'll, it won't be good. And you know, fresh glass, new whiskey. Um, so then we have the cork stoppers. Um, it's kind of cultish. It's a bit of a, a cultish whiskey. I will say this for me, my first time having this, was Cooper Young Fest of 2018 when a customer of, my, of mine brought this in and we sat in here in the corner and we went pretty close, him, his sister, and me to finishing a bottle. I don't know, this, is, this is a little like, this is for me, the closest thing a bourbon can be to an Irish whiskey. So when you taste it, that's what I had in mind. Um, it's mash bill number two. They do not tell you the makeup of the mash bill. It's from um, mash bill two. And I think it's like 21% rye is the makeup of the bill. Um, Blanton's bourbon sourced from a higher rye mash bill made at Buffalo Trace, which is known as mash bill number two. Doesn't disclose the mash bill proportions, but mash bill number two is thought to be about 15% rye. Other popular brands that use the mash bill number two are Elmer T. Lee single barrel and Rock Hill Farms single barrel, okay? Um, Elmer T. Lee is definitely what the ones I would like to cover a little bit more later down the road. So uh, good luck collecting all the caps. Um, it's the only thing I'd say is if you're collecting all the caps, it's going to give you one, two things. It's going to give you peace of mind and it's going to give you a really nice headache because you're going to be it's going to take a while getting all these caps because you seem to see a lot of t's and a lot of n's when you see one in you'll see a lot of n's anybody have all the caps congratulations oh, no, no, no. how was it collecting them yeah Seven letters. B B L A N T O N eight. Sorry, excuse me. The S eight eight blends. Yeah, and I believe there's one sort of robe, right? There's one. I got you. That's the one. Yes, 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 yes. Interesting. So the last N on it has a semicolon so you can know it's differentiated from the end in the middle right press it pour myself some guys um love to hear what you have to say guys at home someone got a little piece is that piece on abelar I mean, if there's peat on that, it's very, very, very minuscule. I mean, space sides generally little or no or any peat, okay? All right, moving on to barrel number 267, okay? This barrel. Um, and I think we had a couple of bottles from the same barrel. So I think we're all tasting the same thing. Remember, comes out of the barrel. There is no coloring. There is no water. There's nothing else added. Every barrel will be a little bit different, right? Because that's the true sense of the single barrel approach. 
And um, this is claimed to be in 1984, the first single barrel whiskey. John, you get the rye on this? Hey. Yeah, it's got a lovely nose. It really does. Beautiful nose. Mmm. So butterscotch on the last palate, but butterscotch on the nose here, right? Loads of it. And of course, if you get butterscotch, you're always going to get a vanilla. Remember? Brown sugar. Lizzie, I'd love a glass of water. No ice, please. Thanks. You guys were here for, um, what's the other bourbon we did? What was it? What, Willis, Willis. That funky bottle. You got, did you guys join us for Willis? Were you here for Willis? Willet and then Kamagagatsaki? That was December. No, that was fun. Have you had Willis? Buffalo. Yeah. How's everybody okay? Good, thank you. Okay, Dalim back here. Okay, I'm gonna have a taste. Let's have some water. Your cardamom shows up here, right? We um dialing back here for a sec. We did two private tastings during the holidays and we gave them just to put it in perspective for you. I sent them out a list of whiskeys, suggested whiskeys you could do, and this got selected by both. Blanton's is one that raises an eyebrow. There's no question about it. And we were doing sort of exec corporate executives type people. And when they saw Blanton's, it was actually, oh, right away, that. Forget about the Irish, forget about the Scotch. We want Blanton's. Just, you know. Aha. Those of you guys at home, you got your little packets. You can enjoy them anytime you want. Anybody here? Aw. That's. There should be another couple of packets inside. Has everybody got to taste uh, lanterns yet? What's your opinion? It's. Do you do you feel what I'm thinking? Like when I say it's it's a really smooth, nice, not overly hot bourbon, and it could literally be. I mean. You could be fooled into thinking it was an Irish whiskey, I think. But, you know, just a little ryeness. We don't use rye, period, in Ireland. We really only use barley and wheat. Okay? We don't use any rye. Yeah, Irish. Well, of course, this is double distilled. Irish whiskey is triple distilled. It's going to be cleaner. And this is going to be a little... This is distilled kind of like scotch, really. Everybody should get a little uh, sampling of Walker shortbread there. Now, for me, on the finish is mint and black pepper. That's several tastings. I'm getting it again now. It's a nice finish. Pretty long, lasting. So who would prefer one and two in the room? One. 
two. Whiskey number two. Number two? Yeah. Ladies, one or two so far? Yeah. Two? Yeah. yeah, yeah. And there's my, if you saw, saw my notes, my typo was 4086. I can't add. I mean, like, you know. Um, now, typically, we usually go a little higher graph, right? We usually have almost always in the last three or four months, all of our whiskeys were above 80 proof. Tonight we got two at 80. Bushmills, all of their whiskeys are 80. All of them. They don't do whiskeys above 80. Or they don't. Uh, or very, very select few above 80. So let's take another taste of this. Love to, let me see what they're saying at home. Diane, I don't know what you guys taste. Oh, Matt Langston. Elizabeth says one is better balanced. Matt thinks too because he really like. Oh, Matt's Matt's always married to Rye. Lisa and Jeremy got the ginger on the palate. Uh, could add some water. This said, get a bit more ginger if you add some water. Not a bad thing to do. This is ninety ninety uh, three. Um, everybody raves about the bottle. For me, it's a hand grenade. You know, it's, I don't know, it'd be hard for us in Ireland to design a bottle around a hand grenade, given our history. You know what I mean? I just don't see it working, right, Jeff? You know, just like we don't call our drink a car bomb in Ireland for a reason. We just don't call it, but it's got a name in America. It's called a Belfast car bomb. <laughs> we don't call it that. And if you try to order it in Ireland, you might be asked to leave. So, you know, but. Yeah, a bottle that looks like a hand grenade is what it is, you know. And some currents on the nose. Wow. Keep it coming, guys. Um, oh, I forgot to mention. So, what's it aged in? Well, I did a little research on this. It is aged. Well, all bourbon has to be aged in virgin oak, right? It cannot be a previously used barrel for any other whiskey or wine like we do in Scotland and Ireland. It is aged in American oak virgin barrels, but then they char the barrels. So they take a torch to the barrels and a lot of that taste is coming through. A lot of the luck is coming through from the charring of the barrels, okay? It's char number four. So they rank the charring according to the amount of time they spend charring the area of wood. So char number one is 15 seconds. Char number four is 60 seconds. So the, each area is charred for 60 seconds. And that basically, it looks burnt, but it's not. And it, it, it causes a ke chemical reaction with the liquid and exposes the whiskey to a different kind of wood and usually adds a little sort of spiciness and butterscotch and those type of flavors that we're seeing to the whiskey. Um, it used to be you could only get the whiskey charred one through four, one, two, three, or four. Now you can go one through six, six being 90 seconds. I mean, I think there'll be a standard of the wood that would be American oak standard, like wood, virgin oak. But I don't, I don't think so. I don't think the quality of wood would be, would be necessarily, obviously um, there's certain distilleries like McKellen who want to own it and they want to have their own Jerry season casts in Spain. So what do they do? Go to Spain, buy a forest, own it, make the make the, 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 the sherry butts lease them out to the sherry makers and said i want my barrel back in two years and then take it back to, to uh, scotland and then use our seed they want to own it they want it to be completely in control so yes there is some ramifications of that but no in america it's they're probably coming out of a few different cooperages yeah. 
Generally, I take about five minutes, enough time for me to go to the bar, start a Guinness, and then bring it back out. It's also a bathroom break, and then we'll um, we'll kick on to our our featured whiskey, if you would, of the night. Okay. And if you have any questions, guys, chime in. Okay. Love it. Thanks. Up and about, wear a mask. I'm Everybody home, be right back. Five minutes.
All right. Hey guys, welcome back. Hope you enjoyed your Walker cookie um, and your bread pudding, of course. It's delicious as ever, I hope. Nice. All right. There we go. Okay, welcome back. Whiskey number three, everybody. Red bottle. Go ahead and pour it. Um, let me grab myself a glass. Excuse me. All right, so we don't do a lot of whiskeys in this uh, price point, but because of the whole 2020 and sayonara, if you would, to 2020 and welcome 2021, we are doing the collection of 21 year old whiskeys. So everybody have a glass, please holler if you need something in here and um, pour it, let it sit guys, it's gonna sit for a few minutes. It needs to sit for a few minutes, okay? There we go. Um, Ireland whiskey, Northern Ireland whiskey. I sent a text message over to Tim tonight. This is a, I mean, this for me is Ireland right here. Remember, South, South Carolina size, um, 1980, 1990, 2000, 2005, numbers of distilleries in Northern Ireland, uno, one. Has of today, eight. Number of distilleries in Ireland, um, 20, uh, sorry, 34. 1986, two. Okay, so we, we survived near extinction. Remember the booms and the bus, Irish whiskey, 1890, center of attention of the world. Uh, then we have prohibition. We have the fight for independence. We have the British, the trade wars. We have World War I, World War II. And uh, then we have just basically, after we joined the EU all the way to the 80s, economically, Ireland was desperate state, like it really was. Part of the reason I'm here is I got out of college in 1994 and I took out a calculator upon getting my first job in Dublin. And I was like, I got to pay my rent. I've got no money to spend. I'm leaving. Seriously. I literally was going to be earning almost my, my annual rent of my apartment was going to be. I'm like, I've been on my parents' uh, pocketbook for the last five years in college. It's time for me to, uh, to do something else. And the opportunity to go to the States was quite glamorous. So my brother was kind of, pushing me to go and said, you should go. Here's some money. I'll take care of it. Get on the plane, drive me to the airport. I land in the States and I'm like, what have I just done? <laughs> I mean, did my brother just put me on that plane and said, you know, and I landed in Florida and I'm like, there's no one here to meet us. We're on our own. And that's 1994 during the world cup. It's, um, it was scary. It really was, even though I was 25. It was, was really, really scary. But um, huh? my younger brother, yeah, yeah, yeah. We, land, we landed in late June, uh, the day before OJ and the Bronco. Because you know, we went to a local bar the next day in Orlando and I'm watching the World Cup game that I was actually thought I was supposed to be at, but we didn't have cell phones. So all my guys had tickets, but I couldn't get in touch with them. And watching the game on, in a bar and they switch over to this Bronco and everyone's freaking out in the bar. And I'm like, what's going on? Can you turn the game back on? And they're like, no, this is all the TVs are watching this. I'm like, you don't have a, a remote control. They're like, you don't understand us. We can use the remote control, but every channel is on this. And uh, it was OJ and the Bronco. And I was like, who the hell is OJ? 
and well, I found out who OJ, OJ was over the next, and you know, so that was my, that was my welcome to America in 1994. Um, so I don't know what brought that out of my head, but I just, I just find it amazing. And you know, I was asking Tim today via text, what do you think Ireland, how many distillers will we have in 2024, given we've almost lost a year in the world of 2020? And he predicts we'll break 50, which is incredible because Scotland's got 127, roughly. It's hard to say, it's hard to count up sometimes because I don't know. So it's, it's pretty amazing. So let's dial it in to the town of Bushmills. This is it, beautiful little Irish Northern town. Glad to say I've been there a couple of times. As recent as the um, British Open last year, I got to spend an afternoon in Bushmills when I went to the first two days of the British Open that was held in Northern Ireland for the first time in a hundred years. So beautiful town. Think about, there it is, the population's there, 1,295 people. Uh, probably balloons up to three, 4,000 in the summer, clearly not this last summer or probably not the next summer. Um, the, um, Distillery is very, very industrious, let's just say. You feel like you're in a factory and, and you are. Let's talk about the distillery for a minute. So the claim to fame for Bushmills is on the bottle is 1608, okay? When I was there in 2012, they had four years earlier celebrated the 400th anniversary of the distillery. And it was a huge big deal at the time. It was at the time owned by Diageo, same owners of Guinness, right? I wonder, could anybody guess what country the company headquarters say, conglomerate, where they're from, who owns Bush Mills now? Just in the room, is there anybody could give me one guess per person, what country owns Bush Mills now? No. You're excluded, John. And you are suited, Dom, and Shelby, and Tanner. Uh, Richard or? Nope. Anybody here? Nope. Yeah. Nope. I'll give everybody five guesses. You probably won't get it. Mexico. Yeah, it's ironic. Well, let's talk about it for a sec. So. The big thing in Ireland, the big battle in Ireland is who was, who was the oldest? It's like, it's like kids playing with their toys, but it really happens. It really does, okay? So Bushmills claims to be the oldest, 1608, thump their chests. Well, if you study it, like John and I have done many times, and this is not the first time. This is, the, by the way, the first repeat whiskey we've ever done in all of our tastings. The number one first repeat. 150 whiskeys later, I'd say. Um, 1608 is not true. 1708 is not true. Try 1784 is when the distillery produced whiskey. James the first, we're back to James the first, James the second. James the first granted a license to Thomas Phillips, Sir Thomas Phillips, to make whiskey. It was a field. Nothing happened. He got a license. He didn't make whiskey. It was 1608. But the license got used in 1784 by Hugh Anderson, who was the one that built the distillery and installed the pot stills to make the whiskey, okay? A couple of more facts. It is a contiguous operating distillery since it uh, came back from the fire of 17. 89, sorry, 1885, right? Uh, 85, yeah. yeah, 1885. It's operated contiguously since. Through World War I, through Prohibition, it actually operated through World War I, making whiskey for the troops. So although it was very scaled back and very slimmed down, another notable fact is they're the only distillery in Ireland, and they, they make it a claim to fame, but in 1850, after the Excise Act of 1823, we remember that legalized the production of whiskey in the United Kingdom and Ireland, because Ireland was run and ruled by Britain. 
the monarchy passed a law called the Excise Act, 1823. And the first distillery was who? Glenn Livett, right? And he was kind of in bed with the king at the time. No pun intended. And, um, but this distillery um, was very close behind it. But it, it um, I guess my point is, there's 176 years between when it got its license and when it produced. And in that time of 1757, along came Killed Began. And Killed Began fight this tooth and nail that they're the oldest and Bushmills are not. And just to put it in perspective, Guinness was invented in 1759, two years after Killed Began of 1757. So we're looking at 1757, 1759, and 1784, and then 1880, the fire, 1880, 1885, okay? And it's been contiguous since then through Prohibition. After, uh, after Prohibition, but it's very interesting, the Bushmills Distillery had a steamship company, which is ironic. It's amazing. And they actually used the steamships to deliver the whiskey to the west coast of America, the east coast of America, and onwards to Asia in the late 1800s. There's a clearly an interruption in production after, 17, uh, after 1784. Uh, in the 1800s, early 1800s, 1800s, about 1820, there's no record of whiskey production when we have it at other distilleries. So either it was shut down or they just turned off everything off and were going with what they had. So um, a couple of notable things. One, the Paris Expo Best Whiskey Award of 1889. Uh, steamship was 1890. Uh, 1920, weathered the storm. Went through multiple owners, many, many owners, um, ending up in Jose Cuervo's hands. I mean, I find it amazing, but in 2005, sorry, 1998, it was owned by, bought, merged with if Middleton and Jemison and all the Irish distillers merged together in 88 to survive. It was survival. Hey, let's get together. We're all losing money. Let's see if we can make this work. Let's get rid of the low hanging fruit. Let's get rid of the nonprofit making whiskeys. And let's see if we can hang on for dear life. 2005, Diageo paid 200 million pounds for this thing, for Bushmills. And I've been there. It's a couple of buildings and a couple of pot stills and very damp air and, you know, lots of trucks rolling around. I and mean, it's not exactly a picture of art, but Diageo paid 200 million. I'm sure, they probably didn't even look at it. Sight unsold, sight unseen, right? We don't know. In uh, 2014, Diageo, a lot of these conglomerates, they're moving in different directions. It kind of has the wind blows, right? So they want, were wanting to do more tequila. They traded Bushmills to Jose Cuervo for 50% off Don Julio. I mean, who knows? You might have had a new CEO and he might be a bit more inclined to tequila. And he says, yeah, we're, uh, we're going to get out of Irish whiskey. And we're going to pair up Guinness, their flagship, because Diageo owned Guinness. We're going to pair it up with uh, half a Don Julio. So Diageo got 50% stake in Don Julio in exchange for 100% of the $200 million product they bought in 2005. It's just an amazing, amazing story of how all this stuff changes hands so let's get on to um the whiskey itself the whiskey is um aged first of all the 16 year old is aged in port casts port casts obviously from portugal uh the dora region the 21 is aged for 16 no, sorry 19 years in ex bourbon and olorosa casts but for two years, is that right, John? Two years, two years, it's finished in Madeira cast. And it's not our first go around with Madeira. For those of you who were here, we did Tyr Connell Irish whiskey 
Madeira finish. And so we talked about Madeira Islands, 301 square miles size, small, very small. And um, it is located there, way down off of Mon uh, Morocco, Africa. But it's ruled by Portugal. It's 250 miles from Africa. It's 601 miles from Portugal. And its uh, population is about 250,000. And I cannot wait to visit. I'm serious. I want to go here. I've read a lot about it now. It seems amazing. Anybody been there? Oh, we have someone in the, in the, in the room that's been there. Fantastic. And um, what's critical about Madeira, it was a stopping point on a trade route between Europe and North America. So ships used to stop there. Hell, ships with slaves on them used to stop there. And they used to load up with lots and lots and lots of goods there. One of them being Madeira wines. Madeira, fortified wines, dessert wines, sweet wines, dry wines. And they were very durable wines, could handle the trip, could handle the climate. And um, it's funny, we're going the full circle around here, but their casts are really sought after now in the aging of whiskey. So these beautiful islands uh, provide the finishing casts for this wonderful, sophisticated um, orchestra or symphony whiskey called Bushmills 21. Until recently, this was, until six months ago, this was the oldest whiskey that ever came out of this distillery. They now have a 28-year-old. And the 28-year-old is 21 years in um, bourbon and Olorosa, and it is finished in um, cognac, cognac cask. Who said that? Yeah. Thank you, yes, cognac. <laughs> It gets, which is amazing, seven years in cognac. Yeah. Incredible. Um, I'm trying to get my hands on a bottle. It's very hard. There's only like a thousand bottles in the world. But I'm trying to get my hands on a bottle. I'd like to. Um, another small fact is when I was at the distillery, this is what I bought. If you open the box, take out the bottle, you'll see UK only on it. I bought it with my wife on April 17, 2002. Um, it's the same wife I have now. <laughs> that I'm proud of. And she was also the one that told me on St. Patrick's morning that she was pregnant. And I was like, you know, today's St. Patrick's Day. It's usually the day I have a heart attack. <laughs> could this have, could you have saved this for tomorrow? Oh, no, 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 it's really important. And it was, it was. But um, yeah, so I bought the whiskey at the distillery on April 17, 2012. I've pictured at the distillery with, with my wife pregnant and three months pregnant, four months pregnant. Kyla was born on November 19th, uh, 2012. And the bottle I bought at the distillery was the bottle we opened at Methodist Hospital, which is <laughs> this bottle here. So it's, um, you know, I've, I, I said I'd talk a little bit about Kyla because really she was, you know, I always think about this. So for me, whiskey is a point in time. It's something I, somebody I was with. It's an experience. Who was I with when I tasted that? I kind of remember them all. And there's quite a lot of them. There's, I won't get into numbers, but I can remember who I tasted this whiskey with the first time. And this whiskey was with my father-in-law in the room the night of our first kid being born. And, you know, I still have a tiny little drop left in the bottom of the bottle. But this is the one that I, yeah. and by the way, just so you know, at the distillery that day, they gave me this. Anybody wants to see it? And that's a bottle. I arranged my trip with Diageo, the owners of Guinness. It's a bottle dedicated to Celtic Crossing. Labeled to Celtic Crossing. And, oh, shit. I, no, it's not opened. That's the angel. It's not open. It's sealed. That's the angel share kicking there, right? Right, John? So there's your angel share. That's a 12-year-old single malt. Another important thing about Bushmills is when all the other distilleries in Ireland were hit with this taxation on the amount of malted barley in their whiskey, the other distilleries all started using unmalted barley to pay less taxes. That created pot still whiskey in the 1850s that became the centerpiece whiskey of Ireland, like red spot, green spot, red breast, that are quintessentially 
our indigenous whiskey because we they're different from all other countries, even though they're triple distilled and must be H5 for three years. Um, Bushmills decided to stay true to single malts and therefore did not ever buy or put unmalted barley in their whiskey. So they have been 100% malted barley, true and true. The only thing they've done a little bit differently is cognac cask in the 28, Madeira in the, um, in the 21, and pork cask in the 16. And basically Olorosa and bourbon in the 10 and the 12. This 12 is Olorosa and bourbon. That's their flagship there, right through and through. From the left, Red Bush, <clears throat> Conor McGregor's whiskey profile 12. That's it. Okay. Uh, then we got the Irish honey. We got Black Bush. We got the 10, 12, and 16. And now we have the 28. Um, what else can I say? It's featured in a couple of movies The Sting, 73, Robert Redford. They're drinking Bush Mills 21. And in The Hustle of 1975, um, Burt Reynolds is drinking Bushmills 21. So a bit of cultish, uh, kind of like um, sought after in America in the 70s and the 80s. A little like Green Spot, if you remember, where, you know, it was like, what did they say? It was like cocaine to bartenders in New York, right? So a little like that, right? So um, I think I've given you the lowdown. Um, it's the only whiskey in Ireland that can, with its age, that can order itself in America, excuse me, 21 years old, can order itself, right? And um, the age in Ireland is 18. We get to drink at 18, or in my case, 12, but 18 is the age. <laughs> um, hope you've poured some, stuck into it. It's very layered. That's what, if you could understand it, there's got a lot going on. Um, for those of you who are here on January 2nd, there's a couple of people in the room that were here. I read out all the adjectives that the experts described describe Glendronish 21. Do you remember that, Jeff? I was walking around the room for 10 minutes going, yeah, burnt tire, cigar, uh, leather, hay, heather. I mean, it was going crazy. This is like it. This has a lot going on, which you saw dot, dot, dot in my notes. I'm like, I, mean, I could go on here, but it has a lot going on. 21-year-old whiskey, very rare, very hard to get. When we decided to do it, there was three bottles available in the city. And I probably won't do it again until I actually have them in the building because when we went to action, it's the whiskey. We're like, I'll be over there tomorrow. I'm like, we need the whiskey now or we can't do the tasting. So let's talk about this. I really would welcome any, anybody smells, smells like a Madeira wine. Okay. Well, I got two years. That's a long time. That's not finishing. Finishing when we talk about finishing whiskey is six to nine months. This is more like aging. So we got the Olorosa and the bourbon married together and then dropped into Madeira for two years. Lots of leather, right? It's got it's got oceans and oceans and oceans of flavor. I don't know what's up there. Mesmerizing, well balanced, warm figs. I mean, figs and apricots always come with uh, sherry and sherry and Madeira and port. Talk about pineapple, maltiness. I could have taken a bit more time over this, but I think I might have had too many here when I wrote this down. It's going to have a nice mouth fill. I recommend a drink of water before you drink this. Now, this is a whiskey you don't want to normally drink with any other whiskey. You want to experience this for itself. This might be a whiskey you drink with a best friend. One, you don't want five people at the table drinking your $200 plus whiskey. Two, it's probably best enjoyed with a best friend. This is a best friend whiskey. Wife, significant other, mistress, I, I don't know, whatever you're into. <laughs> whatever you're into. I just love it. I love smelling this. It's phenomenal. Phenomenal. And my daughters love smelling it. Kyla loves smelling it. Yeah. 
yeah, it'll come back in a sec. You tell Nam we lost connection there. Um, price point, very interesting. And it used to be, um, oh, we used to be um, about $100 and $120 a bottle back in 05, 2010. When you buy them in the distillery at the time, this was like 300 because it was the pound at the time was really bad. To the, and I paid English pounds for this. It's about 220 to 250 market price right now. Um, if you can find it. Just taking a second there, we've lost connectivity, although I haven't. Or no one on. You guys have lost connectivity. Uh, we're otherwise okay. There we're back. We're back. We don't do these things without a technical glitch. We have not done one without a technical glitch. We've maintained our, our record here. At least one technical glitch, a whiskey tasting. So when, you know when we say thick guys, we say thick, higher viscosity, that's natural when it's whiskey ages. It's interaction with the wood over a long period of time gives it what we call legs and body and viscosity and wax it, whatever you want to call it. It gets that with age. Young whiskeys are light legged and tend to be a little hot. This is an aged whiskey. Jeff, you need another pour? I'm good. Sure. Now this would be very well enjoyed with them. Um, this would be very well enjoyed with that bread pudding. Let me tell you, it really would. The bread pudding with that sauce on it and this would be magnificent. I didn't make it so well to the finish guys. I said, finish long and dry. It's super dry. Right, John? John and I would have done this together. Right? We're in different pods. So he works at a different restaurant than me. Effectively. Yeah? I haven't seen him. So typically when he's working and I'm working, we do this multiple times. We went into the pod system, so we have two separate groups, and they don't touch each other. Now, he's here tonight in an exception. Don't want him to come within 20 feet of me. But, you know, the rule being is, if somebody in the group tests positive, we don't have to close. There's been a few in Memphis. It's hard to do. It really is. It's very stressful to do. But it's advantageous in the sense where we close very minimally. So had we probably done this, John, this would have probably filled out a lot more with me and you together. But um, c'est la vie, you know. Let's we'll see what we're getting online, guys. Oh, they're asking online if they can get another pour. I was joking with Jeff, guys. He's a friend of mine. Everyone's wondering if they can get all get another pour. Seriously? Everybody online, please tell me you're one, two, and three. I know it's getting a little bit late. We dragged on a little bit. It's 845. Party pooper. Ah. Let me say it again. This is the first whiskey we've repeated. The first in 19 that's actually on our menu. We serve Bush Mills 21. The last 18 before it. We're, and I'm hoping when we get out of the pandemic, we'll build out our, our plan is to grow our whiskey collection from 80 to, for me, 200. I'd like to have a book. You walk in and you get a book, a leather bound book and it says, what am I doing tonight? I'm like, I'd like a flight off. And then you'd have all sorts of people that give you their favorite flights and we, and we put them in there and and have some fun, but we're, uh, 
we're very excited about what we're doing with whiskey and how we've sort of stayed off the main stream in terms of what we do and uh you know bring on june 1st 2021 and hopefully we'll have a a very grand collection we've got plenty of room you know so hopefully we'll get there you know we're not doing it this year no. we might do it later in the year maybe september it's such an awesome event but um um any so having done three whiskeys everyone attention please if i'm gonna wait for jessica to come back i'm gonna give it 10, 10 seconds or 30 seconds and see obviously one two and three. First of all are we clear i'm gonna wait for jessica <laughs> Wow. Ha. We've already had a one, two, and three on the chat room. You can't see the chat room. I wish you could. So Jeremy said one, three, two. Sheila said Bushmills, Abelauer, um, Blantons. Uh, Brian Davies, who had to come back to get his bread puddings. Hi, Brian. How are you? Sorry about your trip back for your bread puddings. And I hope you enjoyed your to-go Guinness. It was awesome. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Very welcome. Um, Jason said three by a mile, then one, two. And then Lisa said two, three, one. That's Blanton's Bushmills Abelauer. I'm going to ask you in the room to raise your hand, and I don't care. You don't – because now we've already got what I need. But who says number one is their favorite? We have one. Is that number one? We have two. Number two is your favorite. <laughs> he, uh, Jeff, Jeff's going to give us, Jeff, Jeff wants two votes. Jeff wants two votes. I don't know. How many times do you vote in the election? <laughs> now we, we, we'll take this offline, Jeff. We'll take it off. Number three. Oh, good Lord. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. Joey hasn't given us thirteen. Thank you, Joey. I appreciate your vote. And um, we have thirteen to fourteen with Bushmills, their favorites. So, wow, we have, whoa, we have a, a Avalar Blanton's Bushmills just came in. Matt Langston says, wow, one wife course two best friend <laughs> sorry matt that's all that's all yours i'm not getting involved. i'm not getting involved in you and your marriage okay we're, we're simply related that's it um we have abelauer blanton's bushmills special thanks for sending us the tasting to snohomish washington how is the weather in snohomish washington wet no and cold cold how cold and wet eh, okay. 40s Ah, not too far from us. You're fine. You know, uh, Uncle Philip, my uncle is out there and has sent me a lot of your local bourbons that have, I've really enjoyed. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah. It's a big so, thing here now. Might come up in a tasting. I mean, you've got so many around you. It's incredible, you know? There are. There's our folks from Snohomish, Washington joining us. I'm going to Give, I'm gonna pin you guys so you don't see me. Here we go. Here you go. How are we doing? First tasting, right? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. My sister lives there, so she uh, she sent she coordinated the tasting for us. Yeah, I had the pleasure of meeting her. Very nice. She said, uh, I told Bennett he should be playing in Division Two. He's playing Premiership. <laughs> Well, when you started off with saying that Liverpool won today, I knew it was going to be a good night. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Liverpool wins. It's a better day for me. Yeah. It's uh, uh, what was your favorite whiskey? Give me your order, Pussy. Oh, I'd, I'd go Aberlour. One, two, three. Yeah, Aberlour, then uh, Blanton's, then Bushmills. Same. Yeah.
One, two, three. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Wow. That's incredible. See, there again, guys, I say it like it doesn't matter. You know, <laughs> believe in your palate. Trust yourself. They're one, two, three. Yeah. They're probably opposite me. I'm three, two, one. I mean, I, I put Blanton's ahead of Avalar, but I've really enjoyed Avalar. I really have. Learning about it. And, but it's for me, it's three, two, one. Three, two, one. You know, but uh, pleasure having you guys. Uh, yeah, welcome you to Memphis, Celtic Crossing. Uh, get a feel for our place. Hopefully, you get to visit sometime. Yeah. Anybody else there? Bennett, say hi to your. Uh, I mean, they might let you in the family, Bennett. Cheers. <laughs> Thanks for having us. <laughs> Thank you, Jay. <laughs> Wonderful guys. Well, I'm about to sign off. About the right amount of time. Uncle Philip, are you there? I've got another Snohomish guest there. He's still on, but he might have. Uncle Philip, are you there? <laughs> Philip, are you drunk? Yeah. Keep drunk. <laughs> <laughs> Here, hit start. We got to see your face. See how that beard is doing. So, Philip, what was your favorite? He's on the phone with Charles. Come on, man. Three, one, two. Three, one, two. There you go. Bushmills, Abelauer, Lantons. And Philip's been to quite a few of them. He's been uh, almost ever present. Mass, other than your mistress, how did you do with the whiskey? Mass. Hey, yeah. Um, let me turn my video on too. Yeah. Yeah, I could have had this. I had it as a speaker. We don't want me to connect you to hear all this back chat. Yeah, I think two. You like that? Favorite mainly because of the rye. Um, the one though, I mean, it's really good. Yeah. So I'm actually having trouble saying what I would put. Hey, Santa Claus. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Philip. Looking good. Hey, how you doing? I like your background, man. <laughs> huh? yeah, I'll give you a better one. How about how about this one over here? There you go. I like it. Wow. Did you, yeah. Good to see you, man. You're looking well. Doing your rehab, I, I hope. Yes, I am. Thank you. Good, 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 good. All right. Well, listen, I'm about to sign off with you guys and sign off. People are starting to leave here. So thank you all. Great to see you again. Thank you. Great as always. And uh, a pleasure, everybody. Thank you all for joining us. I'll try and connect with some of you here in person before you leave. Everybody on Zoom, any questions, please hit me now. Love to see you all. See you the next time. And uh, if anybody wants to buy tickets for the next one tonight, like I said, just ping us and we'll, we'll make it happen, okay? Love right. you all. Cheers. Thank Bye. you. Out here. Thanks, DJ.